Canada's federal government has implemented a regulatory ban on six single-use plastic items. This regulation bans companies from importing or making plastic bags, takeout containers, plastic straws, cutlery, stir sticks and six-pack rings by the end of this year. Meanwhile, the House of Commons has resumed debate on Bill C-226, also known as the Environmental Racism Bill. The Canadian Coalition for Environment and Climate Justice has urged the government to expedite this bill's passage to the Senate before the summer recess. Well, joining us today to discuss these recent moves is Dr. Ingrid Waldron, co-founder and co-director of the CCECJ. Dr. Waldron, welcome to Forum Daily. Thank you very much for having me. So let's start with this, ma'am. What exactly is environmental racism and what does it look like in Canada? Uh, environmental racism is a term that was coined in the early 1980s. So it's a term that's been around for quite some time. And basically what it means is that certain communities, uh, particularly indigenous and communities of color, tend to be selected disproportionately for the siting of environmental hazards like dumps, landfills, incinerators, more than other communities. And that the spatial patterning of industry predominantly in communities of color is an outcome of environmental policy and decision making. And how does Bill C-226 address the issue of environmental racism in Canada? Uh, it addresses environmental racism in a number of ways. Uh, for the first time, with respect to this particular issue of environmental racism, we're asking the government to collect disaggregated race-based data, but race and socioeconomic status and environmental risk. So that's a bit groundbreaking. It's the first time that we've asked the government to do that with respect to this particular issue. It's also gonna look at uh, getting statistics on health risks associated with these industries, providing compensation to communities that have been in impacted and also kind of tracking, uh, tracking cases of environmental racism across the country. So it seems that this bill, there's a lot of research involved in this bill. So is there anything missing in terms of action uh, to address this issue? I don't think there's anything missing in terms of action. What, when I look at the bill now, I think perhaps we could have articulated certain things in a much more forceful way. When we talk about compensation, I don't want people to think that we are only looking at past cases or historical cases, because certainly, you know, there's reparations required for Africville in Nova Scotia, and that's no longer a community uh, community in Halifax, they've dispersed. So I'm not sure if the language is strong enough in the bill in terms of we do want to know about past cases and historical cases. We want to know about ongoing cases, but we also want to know about future cases of environmental racism. This bill is preventative. So it's not only looking back, but it's also looking forward. So I'm not sure if that comes up strongly enough in the bill, um, but that's to me the only thing that I would say would be missing. All right, Dr. Waldron, well, we know your organization is pushing to expedite this bill. So what kind of responses have you been uh, getting from officials regarding this? I'm pretty good. Um, we're hearing that uh, the NDP, uh, the Liberal Party, of course, and the Green Party will be supporting this bill. I've been watching uh, the debates for quite some time, and it's very clear that those parties will be supporting the bill. And basically, that's really all we need to, to get this bill passed. Uh, is votes, positive votes from those three parties. So I'm extremely uh, hopeful, more than I ever have been. I've been doing this since 2015, provincially in Nova Scotia. I'm much more excited than I've ever been, and I think, I think it's going to pass. Sounds like some good news, Dr. Waldron. Now, uh, considering today is National Indigenous Persons Day across Canada, how are Indigenous peoples impacted by environmental racism in this country in particular? Well, it's clear that Indigenous people are more impacted by environmental racism than any other population in Canada. So you think about uh, Big Two Landing First Nation, Boat Harbor was a toxic site there that was finally closed after 60 years, closed in 2020. We think of Amgen Wong First Nation near Sarnia, Ontario. They're surrounded by over 60 petrochemical facilities. A current case that's getting a lot of attention is Wet'suwet'en First Nation in northern BC. They're kind of advocating against uh, a multi-billion dollar pipeline. Uh, there's the Bag and Agony First Nation in Nova Scotia that was finally closed at the end of last year. So there have been some achievements, uh, but we have cases popping up all the time. And I think Wet'suwet'en is one of the most serious cases, but there are also cases that many people don't know anything about. They don't get uh, much media attention, which is actually one of the goals of 
the coalition, the coalition I co-founded with Nalo Charles, is to start mapping and tracking and identifying cases of environmental racism that many people are unaware of. Some very important work. Dr. Waldron, thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. Thanks for having me. Coming up after the break, news from around Canada and the world as retail sales rise in April and the Collision Tech Conference gets underway in Toronto. We'll be right back shortly.